Welcome to Not So PG. I'm Brooke Blurton, my pronouns are she and her. I'm Maddie Mills, my pronouns are he and him. And before we get started, we'd like to acknowledge the custodians of the land on which we record. And for me, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And for me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Let's get into it. <laughs> what happened, sis? Where did the where did the thought go? Did it I'm just drift gone out? To Delulu. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how's how's your week? You know what? My week has been pretty good. I had a um, very wholesome weekend. I'm trying to live in the land of wholesome recently, and it's been really good. Like I've I've done very ordinary things and just eating well, training hard. Um, I re-signed up to a new gym, which is like opposite my house. And I'm just trying to get on track so that next year, the 1st of January comes and I feel like my best self. What about you? Um, I've had it honestly a very chaotic week, but I think, you know, after some reflection, it's definitely been a week of giving out to others. And Mm -hmm. here I am always being like, you can't pour from an empty cup. Well, my cup is literally cracked. It's empty. It's stale. She's dusty. Oh, she needs she God. needs to go and spend some time with herself and just, I guess, recoup. You know, I feel like one of the things when I guess my mental health isn't doing well and one of the things that I'm really proud of that I do is I write a list of things and I try to eliminate the things that are causing me stress and one of the first things to go is I try to either not isolate myself but limit my social interactions so that I could be reflective and then I get rid of alcohol because I think you know a mixture of bad mental health and alcohol doesn't always agree with me And I feel like, you know, I sometimes can get worse if, you know, I do go out and socialize and, and, you know, just have a few wines that the next day I just always feel really much more shittier. Yeah. And I've been nearly two months um, not drinking, which has actually been really good. I went all of October. (gasps) That's amazing. And I'm going into two weeks into November. Yes. It's been good. Yes. I know that feeling all too well. Like recently I've really been working on this. I've been really trying to change my relationship with myself and alcohol. Alcohol to me is the gateway to negative experiences and negative feelings about myself. And I know that like recently I've been burning the candle at both ends. I've been working hard and playing hard. And that playing hard involves alcohol a lot. And I'm really focusing on understanding my relationship with alcohol and understanding that, oh, if I look at the historical like effects of alcohol on not just me but my family, I have a lot of really tough lineage to be working with here, both on my mum's side and my dad's side. And so I'm trying really hard in therapy but also just in my day-to-day life to not have it be a part of my world. And I did it successfully this weekend. I mean, I never drink Monday to Friday, so I'm not an at-home drinker. There's no alcohol in my house. There's, like, no relationship that I feed on during the week with alcohol. But as soon as it gets to, like, a Friday night, 4 p.m. Friday, I'm like, yep, bam, I deserve a drink. No, that needs to stop. Like, that needs to stop. So this weekend I put it into practice. I didn't drink at all. Went out to dinner on Friday night and just didn't order a drink with my meal. I just had a Coke Zero, woke up Saturday, did all the things I said I was going to do, had an early night, movies in bed on Saturday night, like very chill vibes, and then Sunday did all the things I said I was going to do, feeling great. And here I am, you know, recording a few days after the weekend and feeling really good because I didn't drink at all. And I know that it has a flow on effect. So, I get what you're saying. Like your relationship with alcohol, it needs to be something that is a conscious thing to think about constantly. Yes. And I never had any type of, you know, relationship, like a bad relationship with alcohol. Yeah. Like, yes. you know, within my adult life. Yeah. But my family's experience hasn't always been the most positive. And let's just take it back, you know, like let's just take it back. It wasn't – alcohol was introduced through colonisation. It wasn't – Absolutely. In our culture or in our communities. Like it was brought, it was imported, and it's been quite a negative 
effect on our people, you know, and it's it's devastating. Mm-hmm. But in general, right, you know, you know, one in twenty Australians have an addiction or substance abuse problem, and that goes to show, you know, the level in the increase of mental health problems. You know, they kind of go sort of like hand in hand. Like personally, I think yeah. that they kind of go, you know, yeah. And I know that when my mental health isn't great, I should try to eliminate what the problem is and I feel like alcohol can be one of the kind of like a trigger if anything and you know talking about triggers it's like it's a huge trigger for me you know alcoholism within my family because I grew up with it being a constant in my house Mm -hmm. and being something that didn't always have a positive impact usually a negative one which resulted in a lot of abuse and a lot of violence and violence is not innate in our communities or culture either so I have to declare like that is not something that we say we Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are innate not violent people like innate like we're just not at all and people can you know have misconceptions that we are and we're all alcoholics and it's in so incorrect yeah um But we out here, like, (laughs) we out here, we're out here, you know, trying to break those misconceptions and and perceptions that are on our people. But we also have had experience with that in our family, you know, and it's also been a part of my biological dad's um, history. His family were mostly alcoholics and drug abusers. So it's not a cultural thing. No, it's absolutely not. But stereotypes in the media will try and make people believe that. But even in my situation, sis, it's like on my um, mum's side, who is a white Australian woman, most of her family were alcoholics. And she is an alcoholic now and suffers with addiction issues. And, like, just realising what we're up against as individuals, our DNA has so much, and the lineage that we sort of come from has so much when it comes to addiction and trauma. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I need to be really careful here because if I don't want to end up like my mum or or my dad, and I love them both, but, like, wow, alcohol and drugs has put them through the ringer. They've had very tough lives because of it. Mm. If I don't want to end up like them, i got to do the work now, breaking that cycle and making sure that we don't continue to do what the generations before us did. And coming up on Not So PG, we have someone who is doing exactly that. It's Mr. Kobe D, mm. incredible rapper, awesome storyteller, but deadly Gomeroy man. So make sure you mob stay tuned. <laughs> All right, well, in studio we have the one and only Kobe D, who is a Gomoroi man, but he's grown and worked and lived on Bidjigal Country out mm-hmm. there in Maroubra. He, he's an incredible storyteller and he's with us in studio on Not So PG. Welcome, Kobe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to have you in studio with us. We, um, we've known each other for a little while. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen your journey and, um, and what you've been able to accomplish over the years. We've done many interviews, but um, most recently you've done something pretty powerful and um, released an incredible new single, and it's with the one and only Stan Walker. Mm-hmm. Now, that is a big name to put on a track. Yeah. How did that come about? So we reached out to Stan, um, reached out, sent out the track, but really, for me, it was kind of one of those moments. I was like, "Do you reckon we should just send this to Stan?" Because it was like I had the the two verses written out, I had them recorded, everything, and I, I knew I wanted a singer. I knew I wanted someone to sing on the on the hook, and I knew that it would obviously make more sense to have a father because the song was about being a father, and um, I also wanted it to be, you know, another another Indigenous man, another Indigenous father, and I've always wanted to do a song with Stan. You know, I remember meeting Stan back when I was like 16 years old in Maroubra. He was living in Maroubra as well. Turns out he was living down the road from me the whole time. No way. Didn't even know. Yeah. I knew he lived in Maroubra, but once um, he told me exactly where he, he lived, so just down the street. Wow. Um, but yeah, when I was about 16, um, we kind of mobbed him in the middle of Maroubra Junction and I was like, <laughs> Stan, like, we went and got a photo with him and stuff. And, you know, because he was like massive for us, you know, and um, once he, when he won Australian Idol and I always knew I wanted to do a track with him down the line, you know, and I knew that he was a father. And um, so, yeah, we reached out and um, he got back to us, said he loved the track. We jumped on a FaceTime and and we yarned a bit about our backgrounds as fathers, you know, and a lot of similarities and and also just the coming together of two cultures and, Uh you know, like a bit like we were speaking about of like, you know, Indigenous fathers are painted with this brush, this stereotype that we're bad fathers and like all this stuff and, 
for us to come together and, and show that we're, you know, we're proud fathers and we're showing up for our kids, all that stuff, which is just so important. So, yeah, to get him on the track was massive for who he is, but also for the story for, from both our backgrounds that we bring together for the track. Well, speaking of the story, this morning, Brooke and I were going back and forth talking about how powerful that video is. You shot a stunning video clip. You brought together so many different fathers with their children. You had a whole moment within that clip, you know, of mm. so many um, dads and their kids and and that powerful story of reconnection. Mm. First of all, what did you think, B? Because I know that it was so touching for me. Oh, I mean... I first listened to it on Spotify and it like nearly brought me to tears. And then watching the video, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. I obviously love your music. And then I also love Stan Walker, but just like hearing the emergence of both and the story of, you know, the experience of a father and what you want for your children. I mean, I personally don't have a good relationship with my biological dad. He's English and he hasn't really been consistently in my life. But my adopted dad, who has shown me some like the unconditional love that I could never have imagined. I was just thinking about him the whole time throughout the song and like, you know, what he wants for me and what he wants for my family. And then We don't really hear a lot of stories about Aboriginal fathers. I mean, this is like probably one of the first times that I've heard a song that's like dedicated to that. And that's what I mean. I felt so like proud and I just felt like this is something that I would play to my children and to my brothers. So thank you, Kobe. I, I loved it. I thought it was amazing. Your story is one that just really hits home. I I admire you so much just from afar. I mean, we haven't really got the chance to like, you know, talk in person and I'm so sorry that I'm not in studio, but it's so nice like sharing these moments and elevating one another, but also like knowing that this music, it's powerful, it's strength and it's like going to shape our young people and like move them, you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I can't agree more than that. Be like that's yeah. that's a beautiful way to put it. Uh, thanks, Ape Can Thank you, you tell us about the video? Um, yeah. whose idea was it? And mm. you shot it back on Bidjigal land, right? Yeah, 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 back on Bidjigal country in uh, Malabar. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's Katie. Um, who's she does my content stuff. She lives in London, but Katie is someone that I've known for most of my life. You know, she's um. Team Kobe D, you know, she's always bringing the best visionaries to each track and to everything I do, really. She really come up with that idea of getting, like, the the home video clips and getting fathers down with their gear, all that stuff. Like, that was definitely a lot of her vision, you know. And she she just always brings out the best in in me artistically, you know, creatively. And, you know, we just, you know, we jumped on a meeting and we we just back and forth like that. And um, But, yeah, but just touching a bit on what, what you were saying, sis, before, like um, how that kind of reminds you like of your adoptive father and stuff like that. So in the video, there's a lot of uncles with their nieces and nephews in and I wanted to highlight that too. I wanted to show a bit like what we were talking about before is like a reminder to who we were as a people before colonisation, you know, yeah. before we had these stereotypes of being bad fathers because we were some of the best fathers ever, you know, and it wasn't just us to our kids. It was our uncles to their kids. And, you know, a lot in our culture is we go through teachings with our uncles, you know, it's like everybody shared a role because, you know, as we know, like it takes a village to raise a child, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and we were so heavily involved in every aspect of being fathers and uncles and all these things. And, I, I guess I kind of wanted to remind us who we are as a people mm-hmm. and um, and remind the world, you know, yeah. like that we've always been good fathers and all these things that you say like that we're bad fathers, we're alcoholics, we're drug all these things, it's like who introduced that stuff, you know, yeah. and, and it's like we're just trying our best to, to break through that stuff and show like, you know, that's not who we are, like, mm-hmm. you know, and I think I really wanted to show that with this video and I think it shined through so much because – Everybody that was there that day, I remember they just left and just said, like, this has just filled my cup up so much just that day. Yeah. You know, and I, I wanted it to be so much more than a film clip. You yeah. Know? And it definitely felt like that. You know, a lot of, um, you know, we had the Māori dancers and then we had our dancers and everyone was connecting all day and um, 
my cousins, they're part Maori and part Aboriginal as well. Yep. So to see them emerge in that, like, mm-hmm. and and I knew how much it would have meant for them as well to have both of their sides represented. Yeah. Um, and I had friends that were there, Maori and Aboriginal as well. And yeah. then like, you know, it was just such a special day. And I want, like I said, I wanted it to be so much more than a film clip. And mm-hmm. I, I wanted, I wanted it just to be filmed. Yeah. I didn't want it to be scripted as like, wow. all right, this is what we're doing. Boom, yes. like, I wanted Organic. everything. Yeah, and I think that's that's how it came through. Absolutely, and you spoke about you know breaking the cycles and and, and mm. being that symbol of a breakthrough. We mm. know that you've been through challenges. You've been very open about your addiction issues mm. um, and the struggles that you've had in your past. Mm. You are somebody who puts all of that vulnerability in your music. What did it take for you to make that sort of big step when it came to breaking those cycles and addiction patterns for mm. you, but also for your daughter? Yeah, it was. It was. First, reaching out and saying, I have a problem. I think mm. admitting to myself, I have a problem and I can't stop. And that was reaching out to um, my support networks. I've been heavily involved with Weave Youth and Community Service since I was a kid. Um, always done like, you know, drug and alcohol counseling, counseling in general, all this stuff. So I've, I've had them to reach out to for support. But people, like, we know how hard it is to yeah. even take that first initial step to say, I have a problem. I need help. You know, and so I suffered a long time with just like saying to myself, like, I can stop whenever I want. And just time and time again, it showed that I just, I couldn't, you know. And then I had a baby on the way. I had some health scares and like all these different things that were happening. And I had just signed a deal with Bad Apples and, you know, all, all these things back in 2019. And it was just like, it was so much for me. And I didn't know how to handle it. You know, I was a very insecure kid growing up. And, once I started dropping songs like This Life and, and Jody and people in the street are coming up to me and asking for photos, and stuff, I didn't know how to handle that, you mm. know, growing up and feeling not good enough mm-hmm. and then people telling me like I am good enough and people yeah. like all these things and then people want to be around me, people want to shout me this and shout me that. It was like, it was a lot for me. I was, I was, only, I was only about 20 you know, at the time, you know, I was young and I was still like, still coming to terms with all that stuff, you know, mm. and then once my daughter was born, I thought that would be the moment where I'd just hold her and I'd be like, all right, I'm, I'm going to stop doing drugs. I'm going to stop drinking. And that's how I thought it would go. Yeah. But when she was born, it was like, it was, I was still just in that, that state of like addiction, you know, and provides even more pressure, right? Yeah. And I was like, once I, it didn't go like that for me, then it was just like, all right, well, I just straight back to the same stuff, you know, yeah. and it wasn't until about she was four months old and, I remember just this realization of I'm becoming my dad. Like mm. I'm I'm becoming my father, you know, and my father left when I was about five and I met him again when I was about 14 and I, I knew what that did to me mm-hmm. as, as being a child without a father and I just, I always said I'm never ever going to do that to my kids and the more I did these drugs, the more I drank, the more I partied, the more I did this and the less time I spent with my daughter was the more she was going to feel like I felt from my dad. Yes. So yep. when I come to that realization, I was like, I've got to do, I've got to do something. And I reached out and, you know, my caseworkers and stuff helped me get into a detox and then helped me get into rehab where I went to the Glen for about five, uh, four months. Mm-hmm. And after that, like my life just changed, wow. you know, I, I, I still, I still, um, I still drank and I still, you know, I, I, had my own struggles coming out of rehab and adjusting back to life and stuff. But it took me a bit. And then like not long after leaving, um, I ended up gaining custody of my of my daughter. And wow. you no, know, and that was a big thing for me of like, all right, this needs to stop. And I, I know that I can never go back to that life. Um, you know, I have to step up and I have to be the father that my daughter needs in her life. And you know, I, I stopped taking drugs since then and that was about 2020, end of 2020. Wow. You know, it's, it was like the 8th of September was the day, 2020, where that I, I got her in my care and yep. she's lived with me ever since. And, yeah, it's been a massive, a long journey and, yeah, it's just it's gotten me to where I am. Like I really credit my daughter for, for that. Wow. Your story for is just like is so many stories that are so reflective of some of our mob that probably experienced the same you know battle with addiction you know and some of them sometimes not make it you know past that point of like recovery if that makes sense 
And I think that that's the hardest thing you said, you know, the hardest thing at the start is to admit that you have a problem, but you know, there's so many contributing factors to why a lot of, I feel like in my family, personally, I'm just talking from my own experience, by the way, um, is, you know, like a lot of my brothers turn to that, to alcohol and, and drugs to deal with things that have happened in our family's lives and haven't always been like the most positive and they haven't had the most positive role models. And I guess you just like flipping the narrative means like and show so many people like so much hope and like inspiration to want to do it for like our future generations, like for your daughter. And I mean, I'm really proud of that because my brother has also gone through that same challenge, Kobe. Like my brother had a lot of addiction problems, like, you know, bounce from home to home and our early life were, you know, surrounded by just being in a survival mentality. And I I know that you probably experienced that at some point, just surviving, you know, just trying to get by. Um, And then, you know, that's why you sort of fall into that and then you, you realize that, you know, your loved ones are so special and community is so special and I think that's what my brother realized and he's got his first baby actually due similar time so in about a month's time he's having his first child and I've never seen him thank you I mean it's my fourth nephew I need a girl in my life so (laughs) but um you know his his battle with addiction and like you know I've sent him the, already the song this morning and I think like he'll connect with it so much and be so inspired by it. What would you say to other people that are struggling with addiction that are struggling to take that first step to admitting that they have a problem? I, I just I think for me because I was so scared on I guess to take that next step because I knew it meant rehab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's I, I knew I knew that's what it meant. And rehab is like, you know, rehab is so misinterpreted. Like, is there a different like way that we can frame rehab in a way that, you know, makes not that it makes it appealing, because I don't think that any what people think rehab would be appealing in some way, but it's like that it's really scary. It's also I went to a very different rehab. Like I was at the Glen um, mm-hmm. for Did men. Did Barker do a similar rehab to the Glen? Was no, it? No, because the women's one has just opened. Has, oh, okay. has been open for about two years now, no, I think. Barker's brother. Yeah, Keith. yeah. Yes, so yeah, he, he went yeah. through the Glen. Yes, yeah. he, we had that yarn. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Glen, like, you know, um, it's not just for black followers. Yep. Yeah. But, um, you know, they do like cultural stuff and it was so different than what I ever thought rehab would be like. Yeah. And speaking to other people that have gone to different rehabs, it was very different, yeah. you know. It was kind of like learning to live again, you know. Wow. Like I, we, we got up every morning and we had our chores and it took me a bit to get used to that. Like, yeah, you what, get up, make your bed? Yeah, what? You, you had to make your bed <laughs> in the morning. Um, I'm not a morning person at all. Yep. And so it took me a while to, to get that. You do your chores, you clean up the rooms, like, all these different things and then um, some days you help him with the cooking and then you go out and you do an activity for the day, you come back. But they had a gym, they had everything in there. So it got me into this routine where I'd wake up. It, it, eventually, I just got to the point I was waking up at like 5.30 every morning, wow. going out for a run, doing all that and then come back, do chores, go out and do whatever you got to do for the day. All that stuff like that, I just didn't have that routine in my life ever, Yeah, you know, Um Unless I was boxing, you know, back yes. when I was boxing, I had that routine, I had that discipline, but even still, it was like flexible. I could train whenever yeah. I wanted and stuff. This was like a full routine for me. And it was like, I think once going back to that first step is like, I just didn't know what was on the other side, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't know. You hadn't had that feeling for so long, right? Yeah. yeah. And I just didn't know, I didn't know what to expect, you know, and I think my advice would be is take that step mm-hmm. is like, because Anyone that you speak to that's in recovery, anyone that's been there and they've done that will tell you that it, it was so worth it, mm-hmm. you know, and it's definitely hard, but like, you know, nothing changes if nothing changes, yes. you know, and like, I think it's just overcoming that fear and just taking that first step and also trying different places, you know, it's not going to, you know, I, I relapsed after, you know, and it took me a, a while to to really get it, but if you don't just take that first step you're just always going to be stuck in a place that you know you don't want to already be in mm-hmm. you know and just yeah just don't be scared to fail don't be scared to fall again don't be scared to 
you know, because, yeah, it's like we're constantly learning. The, the amount of times that I've tried over the years, even smoking cigarettes, like all that kind of stuff, you know, I haven't had a cigarette in over a year now. Wow. You know, and I've smoked since I was like 13, 14 years old. And it's just little things that I'm just breaking because I took that first step to, mm-hmm. to, to stop. One of the biggest things was drugs and alcohol and and not saying like I, I won't ever drink again, you know, yeah. like I've, I haven't drank for about eight months now. Yep. I think that's what's helped me too is not saying I will never do this ever again. It becomes too big. It becomes yeah. the challenge of your life, right? Yeah. yeah. And like I'm only 26, that's you know, right. like so yeah. I, I know that like and I've come to a point where I can have like a few drinks and, and not go silly. Yeah. Like I stopped because when my partner told me she was pregnant, I was like, well, you can't drink. Why should I? Yeah, yeah. I'll like, support I don't, you. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, love I, don't that. I don't want to be that getting like we was at a wedding the other night. And I was yeah. like, I. She, we even said like, imagine I was sitting there just drinking, and yeah. like we was at the the, the big table too, you know, yeah. the black bottle table, yeah. or just yeah, like, yeah, ah, yeah. Blah, blah. <laughs> and like I was like, imagine if I was just sitting there just drinking, and then she's just like the yeah. only sober one there, you know, and I, I would have felt terrible, and it was like, but it was also a thing for me is like. I don't need to be doing that at yep. the moment, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, I go out and I do my shows and I do these things and I come straight home, mm-hmm. you know, like I don't, unless it's networking, yeah. like I don't need to be out at places all the time and yeah. So I, I definitely know that it's, it's not something that I'm going to be like, I'm never going to drink again, Yeah, but I just, it's not a priority for me. It's, it's I don't need it to well, do, to do things. That's such a, like a powerful thing to, to know about yourself too. It's like, I can still be fun. I can still be the life of the party without the alcohol. Mm. I want to ask you, um, this final question. When you wrote Father's Eyes, mm. right? When you think about when your daughter looks mm. into your eyes, mm. what do you want her to see? Oh, <laughs> that's a massive question. <laughs> um, I think just love. I want her to feel love. I want her to feel, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just I think of what I wanted from my dad, and I think like, or well, this is gonna make me like emotional, but mm-hmm. like I I think protection and and secure and everything that I've really wanted from my I I want my daughter to see and my son. You know, my son. He's going to be born any day now and I just I want him to know that I'm always going to be there for him. I mm. want him to know that no matter what, like I will never give up on him and he can always trust me and my daughter to know, you know, like I'm always going to be there and I think, yeah, just the stuff that I, I wanted from my dad um, and I just I want to give all of that to my kids um, because it's so important, you know. We we set the the standard for our daughters, like the men that they they look for in their life, and the men that they they weave in. We set the standards for our, our sons of how we treat our women and how we are men, and like all these things. I set the standards for that in my kids' lives, you know. Mm. And I want to do I want to do right by them so they can do right by themselves, you know, and, and yeah. do right for their future partners and their future kids. And we set that standard. That's our responsibility. So they're the things that I want my kids to see when they look at me. Yeah. Wow. Well, I know, I know, like you are 26 years old, Kobe, but you are such an inspiration for me as a Gomorrah man, but also for a lot of us people in our community. I've been to your shows. I've seen the kids mouth the words back to you and sing mm. every lyric of the songs. Mm. The way that you write is such um, an inspiration, the way that you're vulnerable and being able to be open with your story. Mm. And your kids are going to be able to be exactly that when they grow up as well. So mm. thank wow, you thank so you, much, brother. brother, for being on Not So PG. Um, we you. are massive fans. We know that your career oh, has you. just started like in terms of what you can achieve it is the sky is a limit brother mm. like and yeah, you, yeah it's so exciting to to see but thank oh. you so much for being with us thank you so much for having me yeah thank, thank you. you oh my god that was actually one of the most wholesome interviews but that's mm-hmm. actually all we have time for today so thank you so much for listening to not so pg if you love us leave a five star rating and a little review if you want to tell us something follow us on socials and slide into the dms Yes, Brooke's handle is at brooke.blurton. Mine is at it's Maddie Mills. And make sure you check out Kobe D at Kobe D47 and give him a follow as well. Such a deadly follow. And you can follow all the Nova podcast action over at Nova Podcast Official. All right. Bye. Bye. Catch you.